Welcome back to another episode. Once again, I want to remind you that January and February, we're just going to focus on options. And in the first three episodes, we covered what volatility is, how we can hedge against volatility using options. And in the last episode, we also looked at how options, just the different types of option models that they are in this space. And now moving on to the end of February, we're going to dive deep into each of these different options protocols to understand the economics, the design, and the tokens that is evolving around options. So let's get started. Today, we're going to focus on Hedgic Protocol. Hedgic Protocol is one of the top, or is the top options protocol by market cap in the DeFi space. I'm not just, this is not to say that there are no, no other options or alternatives available. There are, this is just the top by market cap, and that's why I want to start with them. In today's episode, I want to cover a couple of things. We're going to look at the revenue model in value add, and this is where the tokens come in. We're going to understand the objectives of Hedgic protocol, because if your protocol doesn't have any objectives, then there's no point building the protocol, right? Then understanding how it works, how the protocol works, then we're going to deep dive into the economic design. This is the crux of everything, where we talk about the market mechanism and token design. If you have not understood what these are, this is the framework that I've spent about one and a half years creating to understand and dissect as well as design these different kind of robust internal economies. And this is one of the key features that's quite different from your regular startups. So this is super cool and super fun. And lastly, we're going to look at some conclusions and some ways to improve the protocol. So let's get started with the revenue model and value add. In the revenue model and value add method, we are going to look at the, let's talk about the revenue model first. So for the revenue model, How do you imagine we earn, people earn money from options? You know, people, options exist in, a, in the physical world anyway, but, and people earn money from them. How do they earn money? They earn money through premiums. Do you remember what options are? You know, if you're, if you're young and then you told your best friend, oh, if we are 40, when we grow up and we're still single, you know, let's, let's potentially look at getting married. You know, let's, Keep it open that we could marry each other because we're childhood best friends and we could get along. So that's kind of like an option where by the time you're 40 and nobody's, you're still single and your best friend is still single and then you just marry each other. So that's an, that's an option because you don't, you're not obliged to do them, but you could do them if you want to. With friendship, with this kind of childhood friendship, you're not going to pay for that, right? It's, it's kind of like a social contract. But in financial, in financial markets, there's no such thing as a social contract without a price to it. It's always a financial contract. Financial contract means that there are some money you have to pay for it. So we're going to pay in premiums. And premium is where you earn your profits. And how does this work? We have sellers and we have buyers. Sellers will have this contract. Let's say the 40, the 40 year old marriage contract. And in, in, in a financial space, you have to pay money for this. And this amount of money we pay, it's called a premium. So a premium, because this is, this, if you want this to be binding, then, or if you want, if the buyer wants to, wants to execute this, you could do that with, by buying this contract. So the buyer will pay a premium and they will get the, the option to execute. So, so if I'm the seller, so if I'm the one that is, if my best friend, one, if I want to marry my best friend and I have this contract, then I'll pay my best friend X amount of money. And by the time I'm 40 and I want to get married with my best friend, then we could do that. So that's the idea. So the profits for options models are always through premiums. So you, as a seller, you collect this. And now if you think about it, usually when we talk about options, they are usually, options are usually, uh, central, centrally cleared, right? So just like your order books method. So what people do is that when sellers sell to buyers, they collect premium. And the, the platform could have some fees. 
So the platform could have some fees. And this platform thing is basically what we are talking about, this, this protocol. And so this is what we, this is how the protocol will be earning revenue through premiums and profits. And who, who will be talking, who will be touching this premiums and profits? Who will be affected in this revenue model? We've got three types of people. We have your liquidity provider. We have your users, so your buyers, and we have your, your debts. So, so with the liquidity providers, they provide liquidity and that's how they get to earn premiums because later as we talk about how the product works, how, how the protocol works, we're going to look and understand how, how liquidity providers are earning money and how, liquid, how liquidity providers are basically sellers in the market. Users are basically your buyers. They benefit from buying the option. We talked about how options can be a form of insurance when prices are volatile, prices fluctuate. We started this entire series with that. And so users can definitely benefit in that way. And the last one is DEPS applications. So applications are very useful because when we talked about DeFi, one of the best benefits of DeFi is compossibility. So you can, you can, it's like Legos. You can build Legos upon each other. So what Hedrick does is really this underlying, underlying foundation to build your skyscraper. And you could use, you could use this underlying foundation to build any kind of skyscrapers. So there are a lot of depths. They're exploring the use of Hedrick, the use of different option mechanisms and option protocols into their application, which is very cool and very fun. Now let's move on to the, the objectives available. So as much as the revenue, you know, one of the objectives is definitely to earn revenue. Otherwise, you wouldn't start a company. It is just pretty common sense. But the, the other objective, the other alternative, is for people to start purchasing, op purchasing options from a decentralized platform, a decentralized mechanism. Why? Because in a, number one, it's all about the philosophy of decentralizing everything, reducing intermediaries, and then spreading the gain, spreading the return, spreading the markup to the users in the space. So this liquidity provider, as I mentioned, they're basically your, your option sellers. And previously, option sellers, you can only be an option seller if you have a lot of capital. You know, your wills or your hedge funds or these people with a lot of money. But if I have a little bit of money, I can't exactly benefit so much from that. I can't tap into the market. But what we could do is we could get a lot of people with very little money coming together and add value and pretend to be one of these big, you know, market makers or big whales and then we can behave accordingly and then gain benefits out of it. And this is really one of the philosophies in DeFi, in decentralized finance or this entire decentralized ecosystem. So one of the benefits is we can pull all these liquidity together, provide, provide a way for users to be hedging, to be speculating on the assets that are available. And then we can distribute the, be the benefit to the liquidity providers and distribute the benefit to users. And so this is, it's a, it's a value add to, to liquidity providers because there's a new avenue or a new, new source of income from becoming a liquidity provider, which is your premiums. There's also a value add to users because now there's more options, there's more alternatives to be finding what is the best, where, where's the best avenue to get returns or get profits. And this is very important or this is very useful because in economics, every time there's an increase in opportunities or options available or alternatives available, then there is a, a marginal increase or there is some extra happiness that comes in. So that is, and then for applications, for dApps, one of the cool thing about DeFi is that a lot of these protocols are very, they have a very specific use case. So what we can do with, with applications is everyone specializes in specific use cases and then we figure out how to bring all these use cases together to create a more sophistic sophisticated product where every aspect of the product comes from someone specializing in it. So I see that as a big value add. Now, what about, so that's objectives. Now let's look at products and how it works because I think that's very, very fun. But let me clean the board. Okay, cool. So now let's look at how the product works and how, how the entire thing, how the protocol works. We talked a little bit about this in the previous episode to give you a very high level overview. So I'm just going to draw it again to show you how it works, just in case anyone didn't watch the previous one. 
in general, think of it as... Okay, so you know what Uniswap is, right? Uniswap is where we have this, this liquidity pool. And then everyone adds stuff in there, right? In Uniswap, that will be something like... In Uniswap, your pool will be something like uh, ETH or like red ETH and let's say USDC, for example. So in Uniswap, is, this is the method. And in the case that we're talking about over here, we're talking about hedging. In hedging, you just have one asset, let's say ETH. So this is the, this is the way this is how it works, you add liquidity into the pool. Remember what we want to do is we want to get all these little smaller guys with some capital, put them all together. So this is what we do. So we put ETH inside here. And this becomes a pool that people can tap into. With Uniswap, what we do is that people can trade and exchange. Which is good. They trade and exchange with this pool. So if I have ETH, I want to change it for USDC, or if I have USDC and I want to change it to ETH, I don't have to go around asking people and then pull together the exchanges from every little guy. What I do is I put all the things inside here and then we just trade. With Hedgic, it's also similar because we pull all the ETH together and instead of trade and exchange, we become, we issue option contracts. So as you can imagine, the liquidity pool is based on ETH, so we're going to issue ETH, ETH contracts, ETH call a put. Remember what option contracts are? So we can do, you know, call options, put options. So you can do both. What we are doing here is that we are the seller. Because we have enough liquidity, we have enough assets available to be selling call options and put options. So call options would be would be the oblig not obligation but the the opportunity to buy to buy ETH because we are talking about ETH here, and put options is the opportunity to sell ETH. So basically, sellers will come in or buyers will come in to say, "Hey, I want to buy ETH at X amount of price," and we are like, "Yeah, sure, just input your input the kind of details, and then we we'll tell you what is the premium," and that's how it works. So, and then it goes to buyers, and then buyers pay premium to liquidity pool. So as long as you are, and of course the, the premium is in ETH, or the premium is in this asset. So whatever the premium is, it goes back to the liquidity pool, and whoever that provides liquidity gets to have a share of the premium. Similarly, in Uniswap, when you, when you trade an exchange, you have to pay transaction fees. Transaction fees goes back to liquidity pool. So that's the same concept. Now, this is the general idea, but Hedgic token is not involved yet. And you know, Hedgic, there is, there is a token. It's called the Hedgic token. So where does Hedgic token come in? Let's see. So the, the Hedgic token comes in when comes in in a secondary area. So this is step one, right? Step one is to buy contract. Step two is to settle contract. So this is not necessary, right? The op option, as, as the word suggests, is not an obligation. You can do, you can choose to execute it or not. So if you choose to execute it, then you, you want to settle the contract. So let's say someone buys a buyer, buys a, buys a call option. So he wants to buy ETH at whatever price. So this is my option. Call option contract. And now he wants to settle, right? So that, that means he's, what's he, what it means is that he's going to put money in and get, he's going to, oh, he wants to buy. So he's going to give you money and he's going to get out ETH. Right, he's going to buy ETH from the liquidity pool. That's how liquidity, the liquidity pool works. So 
every time this happens, you know, this transaction happens, you have to pay a fee. And this fee is based in ETH. Because the liquidity pool is based in ETH. So this is where your, your hedging comes in. Because hedging people are staking. You're staking over here. And every time you make payments, you have to pay 1% settlement fee to these stakers. And, and so, the, and then the, everything else will be done with the liquidity pool. So you settle here. And so this is one of the, the ways hedging, hedging token works. And so the 1% is in ETH. 1% in ETH goes to the stakers. And as a staker, you know, we're going to talk about this a bit more in details later, but as a staker, you will also get hedging tokens. Hedging token, you know, inflation rewards. So this is the general idea. Okay, now you're probably wondering, uh, having hedging or not, does it make a difference? Because at the end of the day, hedging is not, in this entire buying and settlement, you know, we don't exactly need hedging, right? Because users can just be creating liquidity and then people can come in to buy. Now, this is, this is where the whole power of decentralization is so fun. Sure, hedging pe people who are staking on hedging might not be this, could be just putting assets in the liquidity pool. But the thing is, there could be people who don't want to be putting liquidity, but they want to be part of the ecosystem. Because if you, if you look at this, the only way to be part of the ecosystem is to be a, to be a liquidity provider or to buy the option contracts. Because when you buy the option contracts, you also get the hedging tokens. So, but, you know, these stakers are not exactly really key from this perspective. They're not really key in this platform. But this is why they are quite important. Because the whole idea of decentralization, the whole idea of having a decentralized community, is not just having buyers and sellers in the system. Having a decentralized community is where you, you aggregate different types of people. It could be promoters, it could be marketers, it could be educators, it could be a lot of different types of people who add value to the system. Sure, the system works when there's enough depth and liquidity and there are people coming to buy option contracts. But if you don't have people telling, telling everyone that, hey, there is, you know, you can put assets in your liquidity pool, you can be gaining returns, or hey, if you're an option buyer, other than purchasing options from CFI, you can get option contracts from DeFi protocols and you can be getting hedging tokens and hedging tokens allows you to stick in the future to be part of this entire ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. So these are like influencers, educators, you want to educate people. Why do you want to buy option contracts? Because you want to speculate, because you want to hedge, because you want to do a bunch of different things. Or it could be people going around promoting to other users saying that, hey, there's hedging coming up, you know, you want to use them, you want to develop them, you want to be adding liquidity inside, or it could be, you know, developers who are building the back end of the system, coding the protocol. There are some percentage of the tokens allocated to this group of people, and they are part of the system. They might not have the capital to be adding liquidity. They might not be sophisticated traders who want to, who, who are buying option contracts to be hedging or speculating, but they are part of the system. And how do we reward them? You can reward them as a, as a, salary, which is fine, but if we can reward them in a way that really adds value to the system by being part of the system through hedging tokens or through this mechanism, then that is quite a value add and it's really aligned with the philosophy of decentralization. So yes, in the short term, you can see that, uh, you know, all this sticking thing, not so important, but in the long run, they really come together to add to the entire philosophy and structure and objective of giving out benefits to a lot of different people. So this is how it works, right? So I think that, okay. And the other thing is other than, other than ETH, currently they have also added Red BTC. So you have two types of option contracts available. These two are, are in general the first, they're usually always the first assets to be created in option contracts because there's enough liquidity, there's enough volume for trade. So ETH and Red BTC. I'm pretty sure there'll be other assets coming up in the future. 
All right, so in the economics design aspect, we're going to start off with market design. Market design is really the design of the environment in which the tokens and the, the users of the tokens and the product, which is the options contract, will exist in. So before we start understanding and deep diving into understanding the people available in the market design, which are the people that I talked about just now, liquidity providers, sellers, and other debts. One thing to understand is that derivatives, options is a derivative, right? So derivatives is a big, big topic. In derivatives, we have stuff like your futures. We have stuff like your, you know, your synthetic products. We have insurance, kind of. We have options. We have a lot of different types of products. Derivatives means their, their assets, their value derives from something else, an underlying asset. So futures, futures of, you know, BTC futures, like perp futures comes from BTC, you know, synthetic products comes from the asset itself. So you can have, you know, synthetic BTC that comes from, B, the value comes from BTC. Insurance, it depends on how you structure the insurance but it also comes from some other, it could come from some other assets. Yeah, it really depends for insurance. And then for options, it comes from the underlying asset. So if our option contract is in ETH, ETH call option, the value of the option is from the price of ETH. So that is just the idea. So in in traditional finance, traditional finance derivative is huge. It's, you know, many, many, many times more than the spot prices. So your, your usual, you know, Uniswap prices or Uniswap trade value. So derivatives is huge. The thing is, derivatives is still very new because firstly, derivatives is not easy. Secondly, derivatives is, it's not easy for users to use and it's still quite new for us to start experimenting. So if you look at some statistics, we have synthetics, SNX, and we have NXM, and we have Hedgic. So these are the top, top three by market cap derivatives. So SNX has about, you know, 1.5 billion lot. And so these are the top three by market cap. You can see that SNX is really, synthetics is really, really over, you know, very huge. They take up 60% of the total market cap by all derivatives in DeFi. So they have 1.5 billion and this is synthetic products, right? So it's, it is an exchange product that trades synthetic assets. So it could be synthetic gold, synthetic Tesla shares, synthetic GameStop, whatever. So, it is, it is a different, they are all in different industries. And NXM is insurance. We talked about them before. I'm going to link it up. NXM is insurance. It has 187 million in, by market cap. And the third one is Hedrick, which is 46 million by market cap. And so, as you can imagine, when we talk about market design, the, it's very important to design the environment which all these people are, are involved. The tokens, the asset, the contract, the users. Because we're talking about $46 million at stake or at risk. So it's very important to understand how the, how the market is being constrained, how the market is being designed, the economics and the fundamentals behind that, because they're really important in, in making sure this $46 million doesn't go, doesn't, isn't, isn't misused. So another, traditionally in, in capital market or traditional finance, Options are a huge market and you probably, you know, a lot of things are hitting the headlines recently and you can see that options is a huge market. It's also quite complicated, but in DeFi, a lot of people are still not really comfortable with options because it's complicated, it's difficult. And a lot of the users in DeFi space are still not the big institutional banks, right? Not the big, big players because it is still quite risky to them, which I understand. And so the market cap is still quite small, but if you extrapolate that and if you see, once you start looking at institutions coming in, you can probably see options and derivatives in general just increasing. This is not financial advice once again. I'm just saying that 
derivatives have they have a lot of potential. One of the biggest barrier is education of people because people don't know how to use them, people don't understand them. And that is where it becomes quite tricky to they're very powerful products, but they're quite difficult to use. So this is why you know we we can see the, the, the growth in value is going to be is real estate. But how people use them is going to be some key fundamentals to see if the fundamentals work. So the other thing about market design is how easy it is to use Hedrick. And if you go to the Hedrick platform, you can see that it's extremely easy to use. And for Hedrick platform, it is just remember for remember we we drew the the liquidity pool out, and then as as a buyer, and then you can sell. And then buyer will buy contract. So this, how do you buy options contract? Remember, options is a bit complicated. You have a lot of different things to consider. You have your strike price, you have your spot price, and then you have a lot of other things to include into, into how you want to structure the options. And sometimes it can get quite complicated. So one thing that Hedrick does is to make it really simple. So I'll, I'll just do a video and show you how it works, but you put in your, your strike price. So price in which you want to buy, if you, if let's say we do a call option. So the strike price of the price to buy, we look at expiry. Because remember, these are all European option contracts, which means you can only execute them in expiry. So you expiry, let's say, 24 hours, one day. Options are usually quite short time period. You can have very long time periods, also fine. So we, let's say we do it at expiry, and then we can choose the asset. It could be ETH, or it could be RED BTC, which is the new asset. So based on that, as an individual, all I need to do is have all of these involved. At, at this, and that's it. So one of the things that I keep talking about is that you can use options as a way to hedge against prices, prices of volatility. This is one of the ways you could do that. How do you do that? If let's say ETH is now trading at, I think it's one, $1,500, or let's say $1,510, and this is the, the trade of ETH. And I, I want to be trading ETH for a while, but I also don't want ETH to fall if, so ETH is now, let's say, $1,510. And if I'm trading ETH and I, I'm worried that it will, worried that it will go below 1,500. Okay. So I'm very conservative. I'm only willing to lose 10 bucks as a loss. So I'm worried that it will go down below $1,500 in seven days. So what can I do? I go to the options contract and I say, okay, I'm going to do a, a put. I'm going to buy a put option. I'm going to buy a put option, which is the, the ability to sell. I'm going to buy a put option of ETH at $1,500. So if let's say ETH falls to, and let's say in reality, ETH becomes $1,475, then I, and I have ETH, then I can execute my option contract and say that you guys have prom you guys promised to buy at one thousand five hundred dollars. So I I'm now hedged against this twenty five dollars risk. Of course, it's not free. You have to pay for the option contract. So that is that's the idea. So this is how you can hedge. You can use options to hedge against uh, price volatility. And one thing that's very important is it, you have to be easy for people to use. They might not understand it. They might not understand the, the specific mechanisms behind because sometimes you might not need to. All you need to do, because you don't have to care about you know, your gamma squeeze or short squeeze or all these other things. Because as I mentioned, DeFi products, you don't have a lot of retail people. You, it's mainly retail people. You don't have a lot of institutional people coming in. So the, the probability of short squeeze or gamma squeeze is not that big yet. And so it's, it's possible to just make it very simple. Put your option price in, your expiry, and your assets. Okay, so now let's talk about mechanism design. Mechanism design is the design of the rules of the, the system. So we have token design and mechanism design.
So token design is the design, the, the different rules. So I, let's say, let's call these rules. So design of the rules. So token design is the rules that the tokens have to behave by. So this can be hard coded, this can be setting parameters, and then you get people to change the parameters. Mechanism design is the, the rules that the system, the protocol has to follow, the users have to follow, the option contracts, these kind of products they have to follow. So token design is really very specific to the token. Mechanism design design the rules for the entire system, minus token. So when we look at the mechanism design of, of Hedrick, this is basically you know, the, the different rules of the game. So one thing is one thing that we talked about often in mechanism design is decision making. Or let's call this governance. Because governance is a broader category. So in governance, we're talking about changing changing parameters. So stuff like changing the contract rates, changing the settlement size fee. Right now the settlement size is 1%, you could change that kind of assets. You could, you could also talk about creating um, improvement proposals to change the different kind of governance or the rules of the governance. Then we also have voting. One hedging equals one vote. Then we have, in mechanism, we also have, so this is not so much the token, this is how the system works. The system works in pricing your hedging. So Hedrick price, Hedrick price is determined by almost like the Hedrick supply, and the Hedrick supply, it is a, a very straight, a very straightforward, you know, straight line with a gradient of, I think, zero point eight zeros and one ETH. So that means for every ETH that is added into the system through liquidity pools, it will be the area under the graph ETH and you will be minting the amount of supply or hedric supply and the, the price of the hedric tokens will be determined. So that means for every, every ETH added, the price of hedric increases. So for every ETH that is being added, the price of hedric increases. And this is basically bonding curves, okay? Talked about it in a few episodes, I'll link it up again. And this is how the hedric price is determined. This is important because one other area of mechanism is how we get information. So I call this community info because it's more like a decentralized information. And this is basically using oracles. So there are two types of oracles in the system. The first oracle is the oracle for the asset. When we are creating, when we are pricing option contracts for Bitcoin or for Ethereum, or for Ether, we, we use Chainlink. We use Chainlink to get the prices of these assets, and then we can price the option contracts accordingly. The other option, the other, the other S thing, is to find the Oracle price of Hedric tokens. And this is where we have your bonding curve. So how I look at bonding curve is really like the buyer of last resort, or the issuer of first resort. And this is very important because they give you the, the spot price, the exact price, because no matter what, they will always buy and sell to you. And this is the, there's no margin per se because it's the contract minting on buying. And so this works like a bonding curve and this gives you the price of hedric tokens in ETH. And this is how, in general, the mechanism works. The other thing is also the option structure. So the structure of this, So the structure of this mechanism is where the option sellers will be earning premiums. Of course, they will also be, the, the risk is that the risk can be infinite because if someone settles the contract and the contract is, is a low probability, but there is still a probability and then the, con the liquidity pool can be drained because of financial movements, then that is the risk. But in general, option contracts, um, option sellers, they will be earning premiums as, as your fees. Then for sell, for buyers, you basically are buying insurance. So if you go to NXM, like Nexus Mutual, you, you have to pay for this coverage or for this insurance coverage. In the same way, option contracts are like an insurance coverage, you pay 
to get insurance, which is the, the ability to sell when prices go very low. There is a premium to pay to that, you know, the whole premium thing that goes to the seller, and that is your, your loss, or that's your only loss, but your gains can be infinite. So that's for mechanisms. Let's look at token. So the token, token, one thing, so one thing I talk about token is your, your token, the, your token policy. Basically, it's kind of like monetary policy, but it's not money, right? So I call it token policy. So one thing, one thing that we usually talk about is inflation. We talk about monetary inflation, right? And inflation, we have three phases of, of inflation. And this is in hedging. Everything now is in hedging. So there's three phases. The phase one is where if the trading volume exceeds 10, 100 million, phase two is the volume exceeds 1 billion, phase three is where the volume exceeds 10 billion, then you will have an inflation, an inflation of hedging tokens to the users, to the stakers. So the first one is 14.17%, the second is 2.77%, and the third is 2.09%. So these are the different inflation rates whenever the system hits this, this value. And you know, one of the one of the pet peeves that I have with inflation, with monetary inflation, is that when when we have monetary inflation in in you know a country, let's say the the US Federal Reserve or the, the US economy in general, when we have monetary inflation, it's because there is an there is economic growth, right? There's price in, there is economic growth in the system, and then we turn the economic growth into monetary inflation to be introduced into the economy. In general, high level, abstract level, that's how it works. And so inflation, monetary inflation, which is the increase in your tokens and being issued to people, it's not like, it's not free money. It's not free tokens that's just, exec that's just given out just because. You give out additional inflation because there is economic growth in your system. When there's economic growth in your system, how do you return that growth to the, your users? You do it through giving them tokens, your money, your token inflation, monetary inflation. So this is what, this is my pet peeve, right? You can't just inflate, be inflating tokens just because people are staking and then let's just inflate them. You, it has to derive from somewhere. And so something that I really love about hedging is that when they have trading volume up to certain amount of, up to certain amount, this means that there is value add. There is economic value add to up to, uh, to a minimum of $100 million worth of trade, which is people buying and selling option contracts, that, and when there is, when this is justified, when this value is justified by people trading, then that means there's economic value being accrued, being incurred. And what you're doing right now is to turn this economic value to, to hedging tokens as inflationary asset to give and return them to users. And you have that for all the, all the different phases, 100 million, 1 billion, and 10 billion. And every time it hits this amount, there will be inflation or there will be tokens being rewarded to the users. Remember, we talked about users, which is purchasers of options cover or purchasers of option contracts, sellers, which are your liquidity, liquidity providers as well as stakers. They are all part of this entire ecosystem. So we want to reward them, thank them for doing all their part to create this $100 million worth of trading volume. And then you're just thanking them by issuing them your inflationary assets. So this is how it works. And, and I think that's a little bit more robust than just inflating like crazy and increasing the tokens like crazy because you will have hyperinflation in the future. And that's not really what you call a robust or a bit more sustainable internal ecosystem. The other, so we have really talked about the bonding curve model. Let's talk about the fees, the fees or the returns of assets. When we look at these different token design, other than token policy, one other category that we also look at is financial, financial returns, you know, financial incentives. We have 
different kind of incentives and mechanism design, but those incentives are usually non-financial incentives, which is completely fine because you need, you need to have both in your system. So when we talk about financial incentives, again, based in Hedrick, this is part of your token design because these are things that you can embed into the system. So there are five financial incentives in Hedrick. The first one is a swap fee of 10% and then 5% to stakes, stakers, 5% to the, you know, like a foundation thing. So when you swap, when you swap ETH to, when you put in ETH into the bonding curve and you get out Hedrick, you have no fees. And when you change from Hedrick to ETH, you have a 10% fee that goes into the stakers and foundation. Why? Because stakers, as I mentioned, they support the system. Foundation, they support the system in another way. Stakers support the system as individuals. Foundation support the system as the protocol, as the technology. So this fee is to be given to both of them. So that's the first one, and this is in Hedrick tokens. The second fee is your settlement. Do you remember we talked about the 1% settlement in the contract current, in the options contract currency? So if it's an ETH, it's an Ethereum contract, Ethereum put a call option, and you want to settle it, that means you pay USDC or get USDC for the Ether to buy or sell, then you have to pay 1% in settlement fee. Think of it as transaction fees. And so this is in your, your asset. And this 1% goes to your stakers. The third one is the mining rewards. So just now we talked about the different phases, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then you have inflationary rewards. So these are mining, oh no, these are not mining rewards. Mining rewards are rewards to liquidity miners. If you put liquidity into the pool, you get hedging tokens. The fourth is, the fourth is a bias claim. So buyers who bought, contract. This is also in hedging. So buyers who purchase, purchase contracts, they're also very important in the system because they're part of that trading volume. And to increase and to influence their purchase behaviors, then we also give hedging tokens to the buyers who bought the contract. And lastly, we have liquidity providers to balancer. Balancer pool. This is also in hedging tokens. So balancer pool, balancer pool is one of the pools, one of the exchanges that you can also purchase Hedrick. So you don't have to purchase it with ETH, you can purchase it via the balancer pool. And if you provide liquidity there, you also get Hedrick tokens. So these are five ways to get your Hedrick token returns. And of course, once you get the Hedrick tokens with all the phase one, phase two, phase three, that, that inflation will also be issued to the users. And lastly, let's talk about Let's talk a little, let's graph out the economics of the hedging tokens. What, what is the underlying economics to look at the value of, or the, the supply and demand of hedging? In this example, we have to go back to where hedging tokens being used. So we have liquidity pools, we have buyers, and then we have your stakers. So you have your hedging stake. So when there are more buyers, how do we how do we get more? The general idea is increasing increase in liquidity pool, increase in bias. Increase in, increase in rewards equals increase in stakers equals increase in demand for hedging. So this is the basic economics, right? More liquidity, more buyers, more, more rewards to stakers, more people want to come in to be staking and increase the demand in hedging tokens. 
and then increase the demand in hedging tokens, there's limited supply, increased prices, that stuff. You already know, I know that. What we want to talk about is how do we increase, how do we get these arrows? Increase in liquidity provider, this is where your, your liquidity mining is. Your liquidity mining comes in here. It could it increase in buyers you have, you know, to speculate, to hedge, and you have rewards, rewards to buy. So speculate and hedge are fundamental reasons where people want to purchase option contracts. But the thing is, you can buy option contracts anywhere. So when there are rewards to buyers, when you purchase the option contracts, you get hedging tokens. And so you can become, um, it increases the the likeliness or willingness for people to want to become an option buyer on the Hedgic platform. And then this will increase the rewards also when there's increase in settlement. So an increase in settlement. Because then you have more of the asset kind of rewards other than Hedgic. And this is, you know, for this we have to thank maybe the volatility. Dangerous, but also this is where settlement could, could you can see increase in settlement when there's higher volatility. And then you have increase in rewards, increase in stakers, and increase in demand, limited supply, increase in prices. So this is the general idea of the economics of the demand side things for the hedging tokens. Okay, and now I think we come to, we finished that, now let's look at some conclusions. So one thing that, one of the functions of hedging token is that it is a governance token. And I know everyone talks about governance tokens all the time, Governance token can be useful, but when it comes to these kind of complicated products, the level of governance given to the users shouldn't be so fast. It's more of educating the people first, understanding how the, the protocol works before governance should be issued to them, which is what Hedrick is doing anyway. They're not giving the governance to everyone, like full governance to everyone yet, because it requires some form of reiteration of the protocol understanding how to use the protocol, educating people, so that when they become part of the governance team, when they change the parameters, when they change different kind of things, it doesn't mess up the system, and it still allows the system to be sustainable in the long run, and not allow short-term gains to ruin the long-term potential. The, yeah, the other thing is that options is the, is the fastest growing, they, they are the fastest growing protocol in the space, Hedrick, and we have OPYN that came out a lot earlier. It is quite, it uses a completely different model. So this is simple, easy to use. And it is, it's also quite straightforward. It's, you know, we've talked about it for almost an hour now, where we are talking about how straightforward it is to use, how straightforward it is to understand. So that has caused one of the benefits to it growing so fast. And one of the, it is also quite easy to, it's also quite easy to hedge against risk or speculate. As I mentioned earlier, you could use option contracts as a way to hedge against price volatility of your assets. So it's like insurance in a way. One thing that, two things that I would, I would mention, you know, could be potential improvements. The first one is the bonding curve. Right now, from what I understand, the bonding curve is really a, a almost like a price pack of ETH to hedging. And of course, ETH changes and then, but it's generally quite packed. In that case, then Hedrick is almost like a packed asset to ETH, to ETH, and then you have all the other things that goes around that. Something to consider is instead of the bonding curve that just fixes ETH inflow, there are other things that could add into the add parts of the revenue stream into the bonding curve to be supporting the price, so that it it is a bit more sustainable and people will people will be holding ETH hedging because the system itself is also generating returns that increases the value of hedging moving forward. So basically, long story short, edit the bonding curve. It could be adding new features in or it could be adding new parameters in to make it more robust, maybe a bit more 3D, having more variables in or having different types of functions that's being added in into the system. So that's one. The second thing is one of the, one of the things about option contracts is that they the, whatever that we've talked about now is, is accurate, right? Option contracts, you purchase them, you use them as a way to hedge or speculate. The other way is, the other way options, they have value is the implied volatility that we talked about before. 
And this is where option contracts, the contract itself is being traded and they're traded, when they're being traded, you can define the implied volatility or of the asset itself. So right now, there, this function isn't available. Of course, this function is also complicated. This function is not available because the, the option contract itself is not being traded. The option is, is really like an insurance thing that you, you buy an insurance contract, you hold it, you can't sell it because it's not sellable, it's not, ER, it's not, 720, it's not ERC 721 or it's not an asset that you could, you could sell. You just hold on to it and once it hits your strike price, it becomes reasonable to sell or buy, then it will be executed. So that's, that's, how it, that's the function now. I think the level up for that would be for options to be traded or options could be traded. And this is where you, buyers and sellers can also earn from that trade because this is where you have your more complicated gamma squeeze or short squeeze, that kind of stuff. So that you, option sellers or option buyers, people who just play with options can come into play as well because they are also a very important part of the ecosystem. Of course, this adds com increased complexity to it, but this could be one of the evolution. Another, but on the other hand, when we talk about this evolution, the other thing is that it's important to understand this is where market design comes in. It's, under, it's important to understand who are the different kind of people in the games, who are the participants. If they're mainly retail people and not very speculative in nature, who are just buying it to hedge against price volatility, then maybe that's not a feature to be adding in because this feature is where you have a little bit more sophisticated institutional players coming in, already have a lot more funds to be playing around and finding new alpha or new profits coming in. So these are things to consider. And this concludes Hedrick, Hedrick the system. To conclude, Hedrick is an options protocol and you have Hedrick token as a form of reward. You can also be staking Hedrick to get rewards. The more transactions there are in the system or the more liquidity that is being provided, the more valuable Hedrick is. Or the more valuable Hedrick seems to be according to their mechanisms. So I hope that helps you to understand a little bit more about Hedrick. I, as of right now, I'm not owning any Hedrick. What I'm trying to do is try to not hold these tokens when I talk about them because of conflict of interest. But I'm not sure how I'm going to do that yet. So we'll figure it out as we go. If you're interested in more stuff like that, stay tuned. In the next few episodes, we'll deep dive into other kind of topics. And I'm also looking at opening up a new set of dashboard where you can have very premium reports on the economics of all these different kind of tokens. So if you're interested, also put them in the comments and let me know. If you have any other questions about Hedrick, how to use Hedrick or other options questions, put them down in the comments below so that I can address them in the next episode. Till then, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!